Hello folks, I wanted to show you a pretty cool clock. This is a Chelsea Ships Strike clock. These are called bulkhead clocks because they uh, mount to the bulkhead of a ship. You'd bolt this to the wall and it would keep time in your boat. This would not be for navigation. This would be used for just general ship's time for you know, when it's your turn to get up and go flip the pancakes or swab the deck or whatever you're doing. What a ship strike means is it counts the period of the watch rather than the number of hours of a day. A typical clock would strike three times for three o'clock, eight times for eight o'clock. A ship strike clock, or sometimes called a ship's bell clock, strikes uh, once for every half an hour of the watch. Watches were divided into four hours on and eight hours off. So if you had uh, the noon to 4 p.m. watch, you would then have off time between 4 p.m. and midnight, and then you'd be back on from midnight to 4 a.m. Similarly, if you had the 4 to 8 shift, you'd have that 4 to 8 shift both a.m. and p.m., and then the third shift would be 8 to 12, 8 to 12. 12 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12. These clocks have a bezel which keeps the dust out and a little bit of spray. And I'm gonna just run it through the sequence so that you can hear it. And so this watch started at 12 o'clock. And so every double ding in, uh, indicates one hour. So it went ding ding, which was one o'clock ding ding again, which is two o'clock, and ding ding for three o'clock. So we had three double dings. At 3.30, that's going to give us our same three double dings, but it's gonna give us a single ding because another half an hour has passed. First hour, second hour, third hour, half. second hour, third hour, fourth hour. So this is the end of the prior watch and the beginning of the next watch. And so uh, next time we're gonna have just one ding because we have not completed an hour of the watch yet. We're only half, half an hour in, single ding. So we're coming up to our, the end of the first hour of our watch. So we're going to get a double ding indicating that. One and a half hours into the watch, we're gonna get three dings, a double ding and a single ding, etc. Two double dings because we're halfway through our watch, two of the four hours. Two and a half hours into our watch. There's three hours into our watch. Three and a half hours. And that's the end of our watch and the beginning of the next one. So uh, you can't tell absolutely what time it is, but this is sort of like a timer where it tells you how far through your watch you are. This clock has probably seen some naval use because the can is um, pretty beat up here. So I'm gonna attempt to polish this. The movement's actually been recently serviced, so I'm not gonna take it apart, but I am gonna see if I can return some of the luster to the case here uh, and we'll do the bezel as well. I'm going to begin by removing the bezel. It's just easier to have access to all of the brass if I don't have to worry about the glass. The bezel is held in by this rod that runs around the case. It's a brass wire that I'm going to stick a knife in and coax it out here. Shot across the room, 
This is what that looks like. So we'll set that aside and put it in later. Here's our glass. This would be how we would also replace the glass if we ever needed to do that. And now we have a clear field to work on this. For polishing, I'm gonna be using Simichrome. This is really amazing stuff. Simichrome um, may not be the right tool for full-blown rust. We'll have to see how the rest of the clock goes, but I think for the bezel, we're gonna get away with it here. Any antique ship's clock like this, Seth Thomas, Chelsea, Waterbury, is going to be solid brass, which means that it can be polished. That doesn't automatically mean that a modern reproduction is solid brass, but for a real antique like this, um, it's not gonna be a problem. We're not gonna end up going through the plating. Just gonna work my way around here. Take some elbow grease, but semi-chrome is, uh, in addition to abrasive powder, it is actually a chemical agent that brightens the brass. And we can see that we're already making some progress here. Just gonna keep at it. Work our way around. Here is the result of about 15 minutes worth of polishing. It turned out really nice. Uh, I'm not going to worry about the threaded area on the inside, but I want to keep it that way. So I'm going to go to my favorite product, Renaissance Wax. This clock, you do have to open the bezel to wind it every week, so it does get handled a little bit. That's okay. We've got a solution for that. Renaissance Wax depending upon the angle you smell it at and what else is going on, either smells like kind of a mint or uh, some kind of toxic hydrocarbon. Not sure what's in it, but it's pretty amazing stuff. All right, there's our front of our bezel. We'll do the inside here as well. This should keep this from tarnishing as we touch it to wind it. Here we are. It's hard not to love brass. Wow. For a light polish, I think I would probably just go ahead and go at it. This is going to be a bit of work. There's some pitting from corrosion and it, it's going to need quite a bit of effort, and I don't want to put the movement or this really beautiful silvered dial at risk. So I'm going to remove the clock and then just work on the can. Minute hand has a threaded nut. Our hand is friction fit. There we go. And this clock has screws that are underneath this bezel. The bezel flares out, which hides the screws. This is a very, very nicely made clock. Chelsea is still in business. You can buy clocks like this today. Might be a little bit of an adventure to get these screws back in. We'll see how that works. A couple at the top as well. Looks like just one. Our Minnesota Clockmakers Guild had an event 
recently where we looked at a number of ship strike movements by Waterbury and shots and things like that. Um, here we are. Remove these screws so I don't lose them. And here is our Chelsea movement. Boston clock, Chelsea. Movement made in Germany, possibly by Hermley. I don't know what the date of this is. Um, I'll have to do some research on this. Got a jeweled platform escapement. This is a single hammer design. Some of these have two hammers. On the front, we have our strike silent lever. Right now it's in strike mode. If we move this to silent, that locks the uh, movement in worn so that it won't, uh, won't chime. So we're gonna set this aside and we're gonna work on the main can. There's a fair bit of corrosion in some places here. Um, not sure how we're gonna do. Simichrome is not going to be able to remove this much material. Um, so I'm gonna just start with some Simichrome and we'll see what the result is. My opinion on antiques is um, they're old and it's okay if they've got some road miles on them. We try to balance making them look reasonable with the amount of time it takes to actually do it. Um, and I think we can reach a middle ground here where we get a reasonable looking result without spending too many hours. I'm always hesitant to use too much abrasives. This actually might be lacquer, which would be good. You could potentially get that off. There we got a clean spot. You can see some bright brass coming through there. I think we may go to a power buffing wheel for this job. I think before we break out the power tools, I'm going to try a little bit of 800 grit wet dry sandpaper on this heavy corrosion. I'm suspicious that this is actually lacquer. So brass is made of copper and zinc, and sometimes one of those component metals is more reactive than the other in certain situations. And so if you put some brass wheels in an ultrasonic cleaner, they may turn um, very yellow, and then they start turning red as the zinc is eaten up, but the copper is a little bit more resilient. And so here's that, that real deep rut that used to be very red color. A little bit of sanding through that, and we're getting to that brass. Worked on a tall case pendulum recently that is very early clock from somewhere around the year 1700. And the pendulum was just absolutely black. I wondered if it was actually cast iron all the way through. But I did a little experiment, a little tiny bit of sanding, and I saw that actually it was a brass plated bob. And by plating, I don't mean electroplating, but I mean a sheet of brass was laminated to the cast iron weight, and I was able to, with a whole bunch of sanding, sand through that, and it, uh, I left a lot of the patina because it's pitted and um, doesn't look new, but it actually, you can see the original material that the pendulum was made from, and so I think that's going to be our result here. We'll do some sanding. We may not get rid of all the pitting, but we'll do this, and then that'll set us up for our semi-chroma as a next step. I'm going to go ahead and go around and get this far, and we'll be back at you in a minute. Part of the way around here, and I started with 800 grit sandpaper, and I've actually downshifted to 400 grit. I will probably go back and hit it again with 800 grit, but there's so much gunk on here that 400 grit is, a, is the right starting point. So when I opened the movement a moment ago, that was the first time I've had this clock open. I have several other 
ship clocks of various kinds, and I uh, obviously did not need to take the hands off, apparently, as the whole movement came out with the dial. Um, I was a little surprised at the modern look of the movement. I expected this to look more like some of my uh, um, time-only Seth Thomases, where the, the movement plates are very, very thick. Um, this one said made in Germany on it, and so it's possible that this clock had a different movement once upon a time, and it was replaced at some point due to wear. It isn't a genuine Chelsea movement. It says Chelsea on it, and as I mentioned, Chelsea is still in business, so if you were to buy a Chelsea clock today, I presume you'd get a movement like that. Uh, and it's not necessarily good or bad, but oftentimes you see that uh, kind of pegboard looking finish on on the movement and you think okay well that's a modern German movement so confess I was a little bit disappointed but my Chelsea ship's bell history is a little weak so that might be what they've looked like for a long time well a little bit more 400 grit to go here and then we will um, move up the the grit scale to our 800 and then maybe even a little bit more to try to get this um, sanding grain off so that semi-chrome can turn it into a smooth finish. I think this is probably a little too coarse for semi-chrome to handle. Here is the finished product after 400. We've got rid of the majority of the pitting, um, all the staining. I've left the, the back here. I think I can get that with 800 or maybe even the semi-chrome itself. So I didn't want to make too much of a mess and have to sand it forever. Um, this grain is, is too coarse, so now I'm going to use some 800 grit, and we're going to try to smooth this out, get a little closer to its finish, so that semi-chrome can polish it up like this clock originally was. Here's after 800 and 1,000 grit. Uh, I think I've got some 2,500. We're going to give this a try, too, and just see if we can smooth this out a little bit more. Every time you go up a grit, your sanding time drops. You're not trying to remove as much material. All right, I think that's close enough. We'll see how semi-chrome goes. There we go. All right, all the way around with semi-chrome coming up. Here's our final product. I think that came out really nicely. There are a few ghostly little marks around the bezel here. You can kind of see one right there. Um, I'm gonna call it good enough. This is 400 grit, 800 grit, 1000 grit, 2500 grit, and then semi-chrome. And touched up the back side as well. Screw fell out while I was working on that. Put that back in here. Here we go. So the last step, our favorite Renaissance wax. This dries immediately, unlike lacquer or varnish of some kind. There's our back done. Now we'll do the side of our bell. Renaissance wax does react with the brass kind of like semi-chrome does, so I'm exchanging rags fairly often here.
Polishing can be therapeutic. Sometimes clock repair is a little interesting. You're not sure why is something not working the way that you expect it to, and you're tearing your hair out trying to get all the strike levers aligned or pivots in a plate in a hard to reach area. Something kind of nice and therapeutic about polishing where you know what you gotta do and it's just putting one foot in front of the other. Polish, polish, polish. But the results can be equally rewarding as making something run. I think we're close. I'm gonna get one more piece of clean cloth and we'll give this one last buff and then we'll reassemble. All right, let's go back together. So the correct orientation is like this because the hammer falls and hits the top of the gong wire. So we've got our three screws here. We're going to orient the movement back um, in the right place, replace those three screws, and then we will work on resynchronizing the hands since I took them off. Here is our movement. Don't want to touch the inside of the flared area. All right, that looks right. Let me get these partially started because the head is big enough that I actually have to shift the bezel around a little bit. And I'll tighten all three of them at the same time. And our third. We are reattached. I picked up this clock at an antique store and it has this pretty crude base. I'm planning to make another one at some point, but we're going to use it at the moment. Um, this clock requires gravity to be pointing down. So in order to resynchronize the, um, the hands and the chiming mechanism, I need to actually set it in something so that I can tell where it is. It's been running as I was doing all that polishing, so I have no idea what time the clock thinks it is. Okay, so that's one chime, so that means I'm at some half hour. Let me go ahead and move the minute hand in that orientation. Okay, so we are two pairs of bells, which means we're two hours into our watch. So we are going to call this two o'clock. And point my hour hand at the two. And this is just a friction fit, so I'm just gonna carefully line it up and press it on. That's good. And then go to our two o'clock position and put our hand nut back on. There we are. Put our bezel back on and we're going to be done. Where we last left our bezel was polished and waxed, but we took our glass out. So we need to put that back in and then we'll be ready to go. Here is the glass. You can see it's got some crusty stuff on the edges um, and I'm going to try to take that off. Sometimes you can use a, a sharp razor blade to scrape this off, but you risk scratching the glass so I'm going to try some good old acetone and see if we can dissolve 
whatever varnish or, or junk that is and then not have to resort to the mechanical means. There it goes. Acetone's amazing stuff. Our glass is clean. I got rid of that scum on the corners. So we'll put that back in our bezel. I'm gonna carefully load this in. And then we're gonna put our retaining spring back in. I'm gonna start working it around. Got the one corner in. Making sure this is seated all the way, and then I'm trying to get these two ends to catch on each other. And we'll be done. There it is. Here's our finished clock. That is totally different piece than the way it started. Thanks for watching. Hope that was interesting and a little instructive on how a ship's bell works. We'll see you again.